Uh, insights from a comparison of the Belle Epoque and the modern times since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Historically, the Belle Epoque era was a time period of inter-European peace, starting in 1871 with the signing of the Prussian Peace Treaty and ending in 1914 with the start of the First World War. During this period, European states, and in particular France, Germany, and the United Kingdom, have experienced considerable growth and prosperity. The Belle Epoque saw the rise also of nationalism in Europe. The period was characterized politically by the arms race, imperialism, colonialism, and nationalism, but parallel with the development and promotion of democracy. In terms of European history, 1989 has been described as the most important year since 1945. Not only did communism and large cease to exist on the continent, but the fall of the Soviet Union also took place. In the long run, these, quote, modern times since the fall of the Berlin Wall would see German unification, a stronger European Union, the enlargement of NATO. The borders within Europe changed and rapid economic growth took place. All around, the democratic message of 1989 continued to positively influence this period, although Europe would see horrifying happenings such as the Balkan Wars on, in the outskirts. A clear takeaway from this is that capitalism had won over communism uh, and that this would liberate many, but also stir up conflicting feelings. The modern times that has started with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and lasting until February 2022, we, re we referred to in this uh, uh, reflection as the quiet years. With the launch of the Russian war against Ukraine has been relatively peaceful up until February. In hindsight, it is easier to characterize and categorize the past, of course, than the present. However, doubtlessly, uh, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February of this year, people will argue that the quiet years have come to an end. What characterized the modern times was peace on both the Western and Northern European soil, together with economic growth, in a very similar way as was the case in the Belle Epoque. The quiet years since the fall of the Berlin Wall, it's characterized uh, the way this time period has ended, remind in many ways of the Belle Epoque taking place 100 years before. Alongside the peaceful aspect of these two periods are several factors that show similarities. Inter-European peace is one of the largest similarities between the two periods, and both periods' belief of eternal peace was interrupted seemingly abruptly. The Belle Epoque is commonly viewed as a period between two wars. However, this view does not take all the political and social instability of the Balkans and the subjugated states of Africa and Asia, nor the social tensions within nation states into account. Although broadly speaking, the two eras are similar in that regard. The quiet years of the often labeled as an inter-European peaceful period. However, with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, social instability in the newly formed states created revolutions and civil wars, particularly in Eastern Europe. This in turn resulted in new borders and a new European order. Socio-political tensions during the quiet years have prevailed in Africa, the Balkans, Afghanistan, Iraq, and the Arab world, and growing terrorism starting with the 9-11 attack in New York City. Despite these tensions and persistent conflicts of the post-Soviet era, states within Europe did not encounter any major disputes, although there were tensions and a latent conflict in Ukraine. The same is true for the Belle Epoque. Even though Europe did not experience any manifest conflicts within its borders, there were interpolitical tensions also between the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Serbia, as well as the German Empire, the British Empire, and the French Third Republic. These tensions resulted in a significant arms race, which has complicated everything that takes place further. An extra-European conflict was also common. The conflicts at the time uh, were the 5th of October 1910 revolution in Portugal, a latent one between the UK and Portugal in southern Africa, and a couple of manifest ones in between Italy, Ethiopia, Greece and Turkey, Italy and Turkey, to name a few. To conclude, the peace that was in the two eras was disturbed by socio-political tensions uh, and latent conflicts that eventually erupted. During the quiet years and still today, the purpose of nationalism is largely to create a distinction against the other. With the migration crisis of 2015, numerous large groups of Muslims came to Europe and were perceived as a threat to the so-called European way of life and culture. The negative reactions to this may be compared to the systematic racism that was deeply rooted in Europe's societies of the Belle Epoque. Western nations saw rapid economic expansion, significant scientific advancements, and advancements in political and human rights during the Belle Epoque. These changes improved the quality of life for the majority of Europeans, so these years are frequently associated with optimism and stability. Since countries were able to rapidly industrialize as a result of this stability, the period is also referred to as the Second Industrial Revolution. An improvement in the production of steel, which resulted in a decrease of the cost of the material, was one of the primary factors that contributed to this industrialization. A result of this industrialization was the growth of large cities. New machinery and fertilizers made agriculture more productive. 
As a result, there was less need for human labor, which in turn made jobs in production more attractive, particularly as wages for factory workers rose. Looking at the gross domestic product of 1989 and 2021, Europe experienced exponential economic growth, which may be in part due to the creation of the European Union as the EU was created to aid economic progress through trade between the European states. The GDP of the EU has more than tripled since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Furthermore, technological advancement was a great factor for the economic growth in Europe in both eras, as the invention of the telegraph and the Belle Epoque made communication easier and more efficient over long distances. In the quiet years, the mobile phone and later internet were made available, which enabled a, a great impact on both communication and global trade. During the quiet years, questions regarding the environment and climate protection became more and more urgent and thus discussed. In fact, one began to loosely discuss these questions also during the Belle Epoque. At this point, nature conservation, wildlife protection, and pollution caused by the Industrial Revolution were focused on. In addition, scientific organizations were created to study biology and ecosystems. One example is the establishment of national parks in Sweden in 1909. During the quiet years, these questions were discussed because of their grave urgency. In 1992, the United Nations held the Earth Summit, where the framework for climate action was formed at the UN. More and more, this discussion would be deepened and finally explode with formations of civil movements and large demonstrations in the 2010s. The creation of national parks in the early 20th century highly indicates so, but today we see that the Ukraine war is connected to the climate in the discussion of clean energy production that is in demand not only because of climate reasons, but also because of EU energy dependency on Russia. Another similarity, uh, on a more positive note, was the progressiveness of these two eras regarding gender equality and the flourishing of the LBG uh, community. While women's rights to vote in Europe was implemented in a short, uh, shortly after the end of the Belle Epoque, a lot of work leading to this point took place during the era. Similarly, much was happening during the quiet years. Perhaps because these times were so peaceful, women's issues could be focused on so much. An important milestone was, for example, Angelica Merkel's chancellorship in Germany, as she was the first female leader and the longest reigning of the most beloved, and the most beloved one as well. In addition, the Me Too movement was of great importance in the discussion of harassment against women, starting a great discussion on misogyny and women's rights to their own bodies. Today, we relate this to the current incidents in Iran, too, where women are fighting for the right of their own bodies and against the systematic sexism. When it comes to the LBG community, uh, times have been difficult, but great wins have been documented here as well. During the 1990s, the AIDS crisis was a grave hit to the community, but later during the quiet years, there have been progressive steps like the legalization of gay marriage in Western Europe in 2001 and onwards. This shows a great shift in society and the questioning of traditional values. In the same sense, but on a completely different level, the Belle Epoque saw a flourishing urban culture in cities such as Paris, where many locations such as the Moulin Rouge became known for their uh, raucous nightlife. From the cultural point of view, the various fields of art underwent radical changes during the Belle Epoque era with the emergence of new trends and forms of art. The movement of Impressionism, which was considered innovative and daring in the 60s uh, of the 18th century, was already widely recognized. Its successor as an avant-garde movement was Expressionism, which was started in that era. In the field of visual art, the Art Nouveau style stood out, which was characterized by the use of formations and winding lines. The style is evident as dominant in all European countries and even exceeded its borders as it soon conquered Mexico and the United States as well. Theaters at the time embraced modern genres, including expressionism, and many playwrights wrote plays that shocked audience with direct and blunt depictions of everyday life, including sexual references and through the use of unusual visual elements. At the same time, the cabaret theaters flourished and became popular. In the musical field, the period became famous thanks to the repertoire of melodies, romances, and more. During this period, the waltz dance also flourished. Operettas reached their peak of popularity with composers such as Johann Strauss. During this period, the motion picture was also born, but did not become common until after the First World War. European literature also underwent a significant change during this period. Realist literature and naturalism reached new heights. Among the famous writers of the period was Théodore Fontana, Guy de Maupassant, and Émile Zola. Gradually, realism gave way to modernism, which appeared in the 1890s and became dominant in European literature during the years of the Belle Epoque and throughout the period between the wars. Among the writers of the time was André Belli, Joseph Conrad, James Joyce, Franz Kafka, D. God Lawrence, Thomas Mann, Robert Musil, Marcel Proust, Proust Arthur Schnitzler, uh, Robert Walzer, and William Butler Yeats. 
In his famous book, The Magic Mountain, Der Zauberberg in German, the renowned author from the Belle Epoque era, Thomas Mann, described the Belle Epoque era by indicating a diverse mix of characters and by doing so illustrating European society and its divides at the time. From reading this book, one can easily make parallels to our modern society today with its own unique divides. The close similarities of societies of the Belle Epoque era and the years since the fall of the Berlin Wall is easily noticed and therefore significant lessons can be taken from the novel. During the quiet years, we see similar tremendous developments in the focus of film, photography, music, dance, stage art, reality shows, and more in a volume never to be seen before. The influence of artists and influencers have grown significantly and it's influencing public, public views. In conclusion, we see great similarities between these two relatively peaceful eras. Significant flourishing and developments were made possible due to the fact that the war and hard conflict were almost completely absent from this era. Nevertheless, however, both eras abruptly ended with war. Where we go forward from here will be decided on either our insistence, either to follow peace and stability to ensure safety for humans and nature around Europe uh, and across the globe, or not to. Insistence on values such as peace and sustainability, together with the right strategies to achieve them, is the cornerstone for our very coexistence today. Any attempt to deviate from these values may risk conflicts and un unsustainability. Insistence on sustainability by taking every measure possible to preserve nature will also bring on board the younger generations who are now fighting for global stability around the world. Insistence on values such as peace and stability require our efforts to develop the right strategies to achieve them. It is important to put unshakable walls and protection around these walls. We have to build the, we, we have to build the Maginot Line, the Siegfried Line, the Chinese Wall uh, around these core, core values, never and under no circumstances to be changed. We need to put a connotational wall around these values. There also must be ways and efforts to negotiate peace, even in the middle of a war. This value for constant negotiations also needs to be protected by agreements and laws. At the same time, we need to have strategies to convince authoritarian regimes to turn to democracies. We should never try to hunt the dictators, change the culture of other groups, or enforce our values on them, but the opposite. We should use cultural diplomacy applications and give them reliable, protected alternatives. In the last 50 years, we have seen all sorts of interferences, active or passive, of the West in diverse countries that have ended up with horrors and destruction. Actions such as interfering and risking the existence of regimes around the world, even if they are not protecting or maintaining basic human rights, as in the West, may risk ending with terrible results. Only in 2021, we have seen the collapse of Afghanistan and a revolution in Myanmar. The Arab Spring, which was enabled by the fall of the regime of Mubarak, brought horrors never to be seen before to the entire region and in many ways led, led to the creation of the ISIS state. The 1979 revolution in Iran that was enabled also because of lack of support of the Carter administration to the Shah has ended up with a dictatorship that for 40 years has disrupted the entire region of the Middle East, starting with the Iran-Iraq war uh, and, the long, and, and the long war in Yemen. In between, the regime helped to establish and provide support to extremist movements such as Hezbollah and Hamas and develop the Iranian atomic plan. This so-called move from total unbreakable friendship into a sudden lack of support of a longtime partner, some will see it as betrayal, did not, bring, uh, did not bring, in the cases of Afghanistan, Iran, Egypt, any positive developments for human rights in those regions, but rather the contrary, it brought the opposite. The lack of serious actions to prevent war before February 24th with regard to the Russian-Ukraine conflict has brought so far only destruction, loss of territories, and loss of life for the Ukraine and Russia, combined with an acute loss of infrastructure. The continuation of such strategies will keep the West in constant conflict with Russia and its allies, including China, as well as dozens of other countries, which may then bring with them unimaginable and horrific results. The way that the Belle Epoque ended with a great war can be replicated again in our times. In reality, and if it, uh, even, even if it looks different than the way the First World War erupted and observed, the world is currently engaged in a war between the superpowers, and therefore insistence on peace and stability, sustainability must be the most important guiding principle now. This means that the great lesson from the Belle Epoque is to try to avoid ending up with a great war and to try to keep prosperity for as long as possible with the hope that prosperity in the end will prevail. It is therefore important now that the best diplomats of the world will be put in charge of the situation and every tool at our disposal which can help to de-escalate the situation should be applied immediately. It always looks impossible to negotiate after losses of life and destruction. However, this is exactly the time when it should, it should negotiate in the strongest way possible. 
From cultural diplomacy tools to economic instruments to others, our diplomats should be provided with fully loaded diplomatic toolkits and then sent to the front lines in order to achieve peace. Negotiations and dialogue are key words and should remain the key words to substitute words of war or words of aggression. The world today is different than it was before World War I and World War II, and therefore any risks taken here or alternatives to insistence on negotiations for peace and sustainability is a risk that the world cannot afford to take. It is clear who invaded Ukraine. It is clear what happened and what is happening there now. It is clear how immense the suffering and destruction is. Nevertheless, it does not justify taking the grave risks and in doing so putting the safety of Ukraine and the entire world in jeopardy. In light of the history of cultural diplomacy, we see that cultural diplomacy in both official and unofficial forms can influence the set of minds of decision makers and often can be the straw that can save the camel's back, uh, making a difference, breaking the events into understanding, trust, and peace. Global events are happening throughout history constantly and we can learn from these lessons of the past or repeat them. Thank you.